for coming. My name is Naveen, Naveen Mogulla. I'm a tech lead with TikTok, and I'm here to present Bridging Clouds, TikTok's blueprint for unified OADC access management on multi-cloud Kubernetes clusters. Let me, let me introduce my team first. I'm part of the Edge Platform team, and we are responsible for all the infrastructure for Edge use cases. That includes you know, TikTok CDM, live streaming, real-time communications, TikTok upload, et cetera. And we have a global presence with multiple different regions. We have a uh, region in US, EU, as well as the rest of the world. And we have around 250 plus uh, Kubernetes clusters across the globe. And as a platform team, we provide features uh, on top of Kubernetes like you know, access management, secret management, logs, metrics, traffic management, and metadata management, et cetera. Um, predominantly, uh, we are on-prem Kubernetes clusters. So we start our journey with on-prem because of the sheer volume of data and network bandwidth we deal with. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna be too expensive if you go 100% cloud. So that being said, um, I just said on-prem and how did we ended up multi-cloud, correct? So first, I, let me talk a little bit about how did we even ended up in cloud first and then we go into the multi-cloud. So the cloud, um, I think it's pretty standard reasons before the cloud, uh, you know, when everyone is doing on-prem, on anytime you want to add, um, you know, new servers to your site or you were building a new site, a new uh, data center, it could take weeks, months, years sometimes based on the logistics, you know, or whatever, uh, which is not in your control. But on the other side, application teams are expecting faster ramp up times because you know TikTok is going exponentially. People want to test some features in a specific countries, in a specific regions, and uh, they want it in a faster ramp up times. So as a platform team, we started looking into obviously in cloud, but on day zero itself, we realized that it's not like we're gonna go into cloud into one single cloud provider, but rather we're gonna go into on day zero itself as a multi-cloud. That reason being, a couple of reasons, obviously, majorly it's because of the business decisions or business requirements. For example, some of you may know, you know, TikTok and Oracle has some, uh, you know, relationship and anything in US, it's all in OCI uh, data centers. So that basically means that any US data, you know, uh, Kubernetes clusters, it's gonna be in OCI. But we also have a similar, um, you know, uh, relationships with uh, GCP and AWS for, you know, AWS as well as, sorry, for EU and rest of the world region. But more than that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the standard regions, right, why people going to multi-cloud, you know, we, we want to go, you know, because of the window independence as well as the geographical redundancy, um, um, you know. Um, those are very standard reasons, but majorly it's because we have to do this on the day zero itself because of you know our relationships, uh, our geopolitical uh, stuff. Um, there might be a question where, hey, how did you guys handle this multi-cloud migration, right? So I've been in this you know Kubernetes ecosystem even in my with my previous company as well. Anytime any outage happens in one of the cloud provider, everybody starts talking about multi-cloud. Correct, but it's not that easy if you started doing it in, in a cloud provider where a lot of the time your applications are very much uh, tied to those uh, cloud provider services. For example, S3, Lambda, you know, whatever you're using it. But for us, that's not the case because we started our journey uh, with on-prem. That basically means that all of our application teams whatever they want, everything they containerize, they put everything into a pure native Kubernetes way. Whether it's a Postgres, MongoDB, Kafka, Redis, you name it, whatever they need it, they basically built it as part of the container. So for them, it's easy to switch between on-prem to a different cloud provider or one cloud provider to the other cloud provider. All right, so challenges. So obviously it's not going to be, you know, a simple journey, an easy journey, but um, when we started it, uh, majorly we have four different Kubernetes environments. So we, we already had on-prem, but we also have GKE, EKS, and OKE clusters. 
Uh, with on-prem, you know, the platform administrators has this luxury in terms of you configure however you want to configure your API server and all of the stuff because that's in your control. But when you go to the cloud providers, especially managed services, you don't have that in your control, right? So, and also there are a couple of slight implementation changes uh, cloud provider to the cloud provider. For example, in, you know, for Kubernetes service, if you create a Kubernetes service in GKE, you probably get an you know, IP address, whereas if you do it in AWS, uh, EKS, you probably get uh, something like example.amazonaws.com, some FQDN. Obviously, you know, the other uh, changes as well, and uh, you know, challenges as well, underlying CNI implementation, secret management, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we are here to talk about access management support. So um, when we started looking into the access management, right, where application teams are accessing these clusters, uh, we found that there's inconsistent OADC support across different cloud providers, and some of the cloud providers was not even supporting uh, at, the, at that time. But let's, let's zoom in on this access management support. So before we started our on cl you know, cloud journey, correct? So this was our previous setup, on-prem setup. So if you look at um, you know, on the left side, it's, it's pretty much whenever a user runs kubectl get parts on their laptop, you know, it goes to some kind of identity provider. In our case, it's a key clock. So it, and user gets user session token, and then kubectl basically, uh, you know, passes that user session token to, uh, you know, respective clusters, in this case, API server. So, and then if you look at it, um, API server, actually talks to Keyclock to verify that user session token and decode that ID token, gets uh, you know, user information, group information, and based on that, that information, it takes the decision to whether to you know, respond to the a specific request or not. If you look at, um, you know, from the namespace point of view, there's two main things, correct? There's one role, and then there's a role binding. In our case, we have a developer, viewer, and uh, you know, admin, you know, our owner role. So if you look at this role binding, that's the last line is the one which is dictating. Like, it's basically telling that if a user is part of this particular group, then give him or her the access to that particular role, which is in this case NS1 owner. So from the configuration point of view, just from the you know, platform uh, configuration point of view, correct? So any changes we wanna do on the API server, it's pretty much the configuration changes. You put it in the API server, you know, API server config file, and it takes care of you know, all of this user session validation out of box from the Kubernetes. From the namespace point of view, we basically ma you know, do that as part of the namespace management. Whenever someone creates a namespace, as a platform team, we create a role and role binding. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is the previous setup before we started our journey with the cloud. But now when you mix cloud providers into it, so GKE has their own identity service and you have to enable that feature and once you enable it, whatever I was talking about, uh, you know, OADC configuration in this API server, correct? That they created it an operator and you have to uh, provide that OADC metadata. The, for example, OADC endpoint, user groups, you know, what is the claim and client ID and client secret, etc. all of that information needs to be passed it as a CRD. Um, the good thing with GKE is uh, as soon as you provide the CRD, then you'll see that you know, the identity service parts are running uh, in your worker nodes. So you can see, you know, log into the you know, parts and you can see the logs, et cetera, all, all, all good things there. But when you start, when you want to do the same thing with the EKS, EKS ha also has their own identity service but it's different than GKE. And the only difference what we found at that time is their identity service runs in the control plane, which basically means that 
your endpoint, this OADC endpoint must be accessible from the control plane, and you don't have any access to the logs or whatnot out of box, it, it's more like a block box uh, in EKS. And OKE, uh, obviously this is, you know, last year when we were researching about it, uh, OKE did not even support any OADC support. But if you look at from the configuration point of view, again, from the platform administrator point of view, Previously, it was pretty simple. Just go and add, you know, OIDC metadata into your favorite tool, you know, Cube uh, ADM or Cube Spray or whatnot. But now, if it is GKE or EKS, you know, if equal to GKE, submit CRT. If equal to EKS, do something else. You know, a lot of these things. Uh, basically, we felt that uh, it's a problematic. You know, it, you're going to have to deal with in a lot of if and else conditions. But also from the user experience point of view. On-prem, they were running kubectl gate parts in one way, but in GKE, you need to have, you know, G console, or some kind of different user experience we're getting. So we wanted to make a unified OADC access across all these, and users doesn't need to know whether the, you know, underlying cluster is from GKE or EKS or on-prem. So um, the first thing, what we tried to do is, whenever we, we tried to solve this problem, the first thing we found, you know, we tried to research open source projects, and we didn't find anything active projects. We found one from Jetstack, but the last commit was like five years ago, uh, and it was written in a bold letters like, hey, do not use this in production. So we did not even, uh, you know, evaluate that solution. But the fun fact is, I, this was the time, the last KubeCon time, where I was in the situation where we were trying to solve this problem. So luckily, I, you know, I came to KubeCon, so I started walking to all the cloud provider booths. Uh, you know, OK, uh, OK, GCP guys, as well as AWS. Everybody has their own roadmap, uh, but that roadmap is not merging anywhere. And we realized that. Um, even if you wait two years or three years, the problem, what we think is the problem, is not going to be solved. So um, I spoke to a couple of other uh, folks as well, and that's when I realized that it's getting too complicated whenever we want to build this solution. So whenever it gets too complicated, my gut feeling is like, go back to fundamentals. Go back to fundamentals. What we basically did is we started looking at the Kubernetes authenticating the documentation, the IAM documentation, and figure, trying to figure out how many ways Kubernetes actually supports these, you know, access management. Right? You know, there's a certificate, there's a service account, there's OIDC, and then there is something called user impersonation. So user impersonation is something where you basically talking to cluster with a cluster admin account. But in that specific request context, you can tell Kubernetes that, hey, scope it down to specific user and specific user groups. So I'll talk a little bit more about it. But in high level, that's not a one-to-one -on -one -to -one solution what we implemented. But that was more of a starting point for us. And when you combined with a bunch of other stuff like you know, Envoy, OADC identity provider, we could see that the new solution could work for us uh, across all the cloud providers. So in terms of the new architecture, if you look at from the right side, these are the clusters. It doesn't matter whether it's an on-prem cluster, or the GKE cluster, or EKS cluster. But also, there's no changes from the namespace as well. So we don't have to do a lot more stuff on our existing thing. So it's the same uh, you know, role and role binding as well. But if you closely observe API server, this is not the one which is talking to key clock anymore to validate that user session token. Rather, we delegated that functionality to one step up front. In our case, this is Envoy. And Envoy has something called you know, uh, external authorization, where you, this particular authorization server takes the responsibility of user session token validation. And it, it is talking, it's going to talk to key clock, and it's going to do that magic of user impersonation, whatever we're talking about. So in a newer flow, user basically still runs the kubectl get parts, and it goes to key clock and gets the user session token. 
Now, in user cube config, we don't have any details of the target clusters, but rather they're pointing, pointed to Envoy. So in this case, it presents to Envoy. Envoy basically you know, uh, va uh, forwards the request to authorization server. Authorization server validates that user session token, decodes that I, you know, user ID groups, and overrides it with that you know, user impersonation, whatever is Kubernetes is expecting, and responds back to Envoy, and now Envoy has to go and connect to whatever your target clusters, in this case, on-prem, or GKE, or EKS. So, in high level, the flow, whatever I just talked about, runs the kubectl uh, command initiation, and then it goes to reverse proxy, and then there is impersonation and request forwarding is happening at the Envoy level. So, in terms of the core components, if you closely look at this diagram once again, so you have this Envoy, and then there's the authorization server, but in both the cases, uh, Envoy needs cluster information because this is no longer coming from the kube config. Authorization server also needs cluster barrier token, service account barrier token, which has access to the entire cluster. So in terms of the core components here, it's one of the, you know, one is Envoy, the second one is authorization server, and third one is uh, cluster metadata. So reverse proxy, authorization server, and cluster metadata. Let's go step by step uh, into each and every component. So by no means this is Envoy presentation, but I just wanted to show you guys in terms of um, you know, visualizing the block diagram, how does a request flows through Envoy reverse proxy? If you look at the bottom, Envoy has some constructs, something called listeners, routes, HTTP filters, clusters. This is not Kubernetes cluster, but it's rather you know, backend. They, you know, it uses the same terminology as the cluster. So you can expose the ports uh, on the listener. In our case, it could be you know, 8080 and 8443. And then there is a route section. Route section is where you define incoming routes, you know, the matches. So in our case, you know, every cluster has its own route. We went cluster, cluster one, if it's cluster two, cluster three. So whenever a request comes here and it gets matched with this particular block, it, it basically what this is telling us, hey, whenever the request comes with this prefix, forward it to cluster one backend. If it comes with cluster two, forward it to cluster two backend. If it comes with cluster three, forward it to cluster three backend. But before forwarding it to the backend, Envoy also allows you to configure something called HTTP filters. You can pass that request through multiple filters. And in this specific case, there is a filter called external RZ, which basically means that you're configuring Envoy to, hey, this is my authorization server, external. Every time any request comes in, you forward it to me and I take the decision of authorization. So, so in high level, there's pretty much the route section, HTTP filter section, and cluster section, and we can go one by one in this specific you know, OIDC use case. So route section, like I said, uh, every cluster will have its own routes, but when I started doing the POC, correct? So I realized that kubectl commands, there are two different types of command. One of them is you know, special needs special handling. For example, exec, kubectl exec, kubectl logs minus f or port forward because it needs a different protocol, you know, WebSocket or SPDY. But everything else is just an HTTP um, request. So for us, we created two routes. If you look at closely on the left side, it basically says that, hey, anytime any request comes with this prefix, cluster one prefix, but with the upgrade connection type is equals to WebSocket, then forward it to this backend, you know, Kubernetes upgrade cluster one. But on the right side, if you look at, you know, everything else, like all the HTTP endpoints can point to, you know, this particular route. So this is more of a route. So now think about whenever request comes to this, it looks at it and okay, it found the match and then the next step. Next step is before we forwarding it to the backend, we are basically saying that, hey, um, you know, 
pass this request through ext authorization uh, um, in a plugin. If you closely look at it, again, this is not inside Envoy, but this is more like you're outside, but in, uh, you can configure Envoy that, hey, anytime a request comes in, forward it to this external authorization server. So if you look at this, the plugin name called http.ext underscore rz, and it needs three information. One of them is, hey, what is the endpoint? Anytime a request comes in, where do you want me to forward it to? Two, what are the incoming requests I'm expecting at that external server? In, in this case, I'm telling like, hey, this is authorization header. You pass that authorization header to uh, you know, uh, uh, external authorization server. But also on the response, hey, I'm going to add some manipulate some things on the authorization header server. So, and these are the ones which I'm going to manipulate. In this case, impersonate. And uh, this is important because that's basically what Kubernetes is expecting. So there are two things, authorization and impersonation. Those things are coming back from the authorization server. And on the right side, you, it's a pretty standard backend for that, you know, wherever you deployed it, you basically go provide that information for that external authorization server. So now the request came in to route, and then go to the external RZ, and external RZ did its magic and came back with this header. And now we're going to have to forward that request to the backend. Remember that you know a user cube config doesn't have cluster information, but Envoy needs to have that information. So in this case, you know if you look at these things, it needs two informations. One of them is what is the cluster API endpoint, whatever your cluster API server endpoint. And Kubernetes supports only HTTPS. That means you need to provide that CA config, you know, uh, your certificate authority to the, uh, you know, Envoy as well. If you don't use these things, you know, before that it used to be as part of your kube config. So whatever is the, was there in kube config, it goes into this. You know, this is the API server endpoint, and this is the. Um, you know, CA cert for that particular specific cluster. Uh, we have two specific, you know, two different back, uh, backends because of the same reason whatever I talked about in the routing section. So we separated them into, you know, special command backend and as well as the regular command. So these are the cluster configuration. Um, that's more of Envoy. And now the second core component is about authorization server. So this is where you basically build a logic, you know, of validating user session token, decode that, you know, open ID token, and retrieve the user ID groups and whatever you want to retrieve that from that, uh, you know, ID token. Then do this magic. This is where you have to. Uh, you know, provide that impersonation. So Kubernetes expects that documentation tells you that, hey, if you are using user impersonation, this is how you can tell me that you want to use user impersonation. In this case, there's some, you know, three headers, the, you know, two headers. There's something called impersonate user. In, the, in my in case, that could be navin.am at tiktok.com, and then the groups, impersonate group, whatever user is, part, you know, part of the groups. Um, a couple of um, gotchas uh, which we found during our POC, which we, you know, a hard way where we took a lot of time to uh, understand, you know, find out this, find this out. Um, that external authorization server, you can build it in gRPC or you can build it in HTTP. So when we built it in gRPC, the problem was if user is part of 10 groups, the gRPC metadata basically gets overwritten by one single group. So if you have 10 groups, all the first nine groups gets overwritten, overwritten by the 10th group. So you, you can see the Envoy uh, open source uh, issues as well. You'll see a lot of the issues related to that. Uh, but if you switch to HTTP, then all of these headers, whatever 10 user uh, group membership, you can append all of those groups uh, according to what Kubernetes is expecting. So it's important that you know you have to switch to HTTP service implementation on authorization server uh, compared to you know gRPC. So that's about authorization server. And then the cluster metadata, right? So cluster metadata, like we talked about, if, if you look at authorization server, this is where 
we are going to have to the authorization server basically overrides user session token after successful validation with cluster administration bearer token. So somehow you have to present you know, authorization server with this clusters bearer token. And the second one is in the cluster details, if you look at it, you need to have this cluster API server details as well as the CA config. So the cluster metadata, it depends on your config. Uh, I'm just gonna provide an idea here how we did it. So we basically have all of this information as a Kubernetes secret and uh, made it available to Envoy as well as authorization header. So it picks up that information whenever it needs to overwrite user session token. It could be manual or it could be automated, uh, but uh, in our case, we kind of automated in a way that anytime a data plane Kubernetes cluster comes up, uh, it uh, gets onboarded onto the control plane cluster. Uh, but also along with it, we have you know, automation for Argo CD cluster registration, uh, um, you know, Hashco vault registration, et cetera. So we onboarded this OADC service as well. So it's our, every time a new cluster comes in and that Kubernetes secrets gets created in that particular uh, namespace so that Envoy and uh, uh, authorization server can pick up that information. All right, so that's the basic idea you can use to build the solution. Um, but if you look at you know all of this, this is a bunch of YAML files in uh, Envoy. So you can always build um, Envoy using a static YAML file, but also Envoy provides something called dynamic configuration loading using Envoy XDS. So we switched to XDS because of the number of clusters we deal with, you know, and the frequency of uh, cluster lifecycle events. So we switched it to Envoy XDS where everything is written inside the Golang code. Anytime a new cluster comes in, we basically picks that up and updates the Envoy without needs without Envoy needs to be restarted or anything. So everything is automated in our case. Uh, but also on the other hand, there is a service account. Uh, you know, there's probably, if you're a security person, there's probably rings, you know, uh, bells ringing because, hey, that service account has access to the entire cluster and you need to have, uh, you know, uh, you need to secure that service account. Yes, we have, you know, our back control, everything, no one else can access that namespace other than the, you know, few of the pl platform administrators. But we also went a little bit further and uh, we, we also enabled r rotating those service account tokens. So we have a HashiCo uh, vault and there's a Kubernetes secret engine. And we use the Kubernetes secret engine to rotate these cluster admin bearer tokens every one hour. Every one hour it gets rotated so that even if someone gets hold of the particular token, uh, within an hour it gets, uh, you know, uh, invalidated. Yeah, so in high level, this is more of a, you know, idea, uh, the blueprint where you guys could take it and you know, start implementing it if you are in the same boat. Uh, but um, yeah, this help does uh, basically, it doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, a you know, cloud providers are on-prem, pretty much it's the same thing. But also we removed that uh, user session validation from the cluster side and put it in the, you know, one front, uh, one step further, uh, one, step, uh, one step front. That help does to, you know, users not needing to deal with VPN or whatnot if you put that in the DMZ zone or et cetera. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I have. Um, thank you. And if you guys have any questions, I would love to answer it. But if not, I can, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm curious, like, what did you use for the authorization server itself? Um, like, when we were planning, we were testing this out, we were testing it with OAuth2 proxy. Mm -hmm. And at that time, like, Envoy did not have support for HTTP. Um, like, the external auth filter did not work over HTTP. And 
-hmm. So it was only doing gRPC and ROWASP to proxy was only doing HTTP. So we had to like build like a um, okay. layer um, and it was just getting too complicated. So we decided to go against it, but I'm curious how what, what server you are use, using. It's a pretty standard um, in a Golang server, right? If we just build a Golang application and uh, expose an API, just you, I need to follow what Envoy is telling us to follow. Like, hey, you, this, this is the request and this is the response and you just need to implement that request and response. And that's pretty much what we had to do it. There's no specific uh, things we need. Just a pretty standard Golang application. Uh, but what we have done in our case is because we have Envoy XDS and then there's the authorized server, we just merge both of them together. So it serves as Envoy XDS where it's basically updating cluster metadata but also serving it as a server for authorization. But it could be completely two different uh, you know, Golang applications. Yeah. Got it. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Hey. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You mentioned you look at the available open source project and didn't find uh, the one that was uh, suited for you. I don't know. Did you look at the open source project called Teleport? It basically can do like exactly what you described, but it's already like packaged, neatly packaged, and you don't have to do a lot of manual stuff and it has like additional nice features like auditing and stuff like that. Great, so I, um, unfortunately, yeah. So at least it did not, probably it's not, like, you know, in the Google search or anywhere. So I, we spent like almost a week or two weeks to, uh, searching, uh, you know, uh, related to this particular project. Nothing found and even during KubeCon, we talked to a bunch of people, no one actually, you know, referencing, you know, whatever the project you're talking about, but rather everybody's giving more, you know, newer ideas. So, yeah, unfortunately, we, I didn't find it, um, but I'm glad, you know, it's already there. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, it, I, we didn't find it during the, our research at that time. Yeah, but I mean, you can check it out, like, yes. Yeah, see, like, so uh, I would definitely talk to you uh, after this. Um, what's the name of it again? Uh, teleport. Teleport? Okay. All right, yeah, Teleport probably works a little bit different, but yeah, we can talk about it and see if that's exactly how, you know, Teleport is also doing it. Thank you. Um, I was curious about the choice to use uh, Keycloak rather than something like uh, um, Identity Backend, like Google uh, for your employees. Um, can you talk through that decision? Uh, sorry, one, uh, say it one more time, please. Uh, you, you used uh, Keycloak as your identity backend, um, and I'm curious because I, I assume that you also have some sort of employee registry uh, that already has identity, uh, and I was curious about that decision. Yeah, so in our system, it's more like you have a centralized SSO system, which basically authenticates the user, but specific to Kubernetes platform, we have our own key clock as an identity provider. So whenever someone um, a, in our platform creates a project or creates a namespace, et cetera, we create the groups in our own key clock you know, identity provider. So anytime user wants to access it, user goes through central SSO and then federate it to the identity provider, you know, uh, key clock in our case. And then key clock basically verifies that and generates an ID token and presents it back to us, and we use that as a session token moving forward to our own application. Thank you. All right, thanks. Hey. Hi, so in terms of um, how you deploy the Envoy proxy, so I know something like Keycloak, it sounds like if you just have like one central key cloak, that's not really a problem because there's not a whole lot of traffic going back and forth to it. So if you have a developer geolocated somewhere inconvenient to access key cloak, it's not really a problem. But it sounds like that wouldn't be the case for Envoy necessarily because if your traffic to the API server has to keep being proxied halfway across the world, that would be a lot of latency. So do you have the Envoy proxy like distributed across like geolocated or how does that work? Yeah, that's a very valid question. So at least, based on our tests. So, uh, you know, majority of the team sits in, you know, um, US, but TikTok is big, we are global, we have a lot of uh, developers in uh, Singapore, London, etc. So far, the response time delay is somewhere around 
less than 10 milliseconds. So it's definitely not impactful in terms of the performance degradation so far. Um, but eventually, if it, you know, we had some instances where someone complained from Singapore that, hey, it's taking more than what it used to be. But at that time, we're going to have to figure out if, if, if we're going to have to distribute the Envoy into a different region. But at the moment, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not a big problem. But you're right. It could be a problem at some point of time. Thank yeah. you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm kind of curious if you had a any issues with the XLSD policy. Maybe you had a lot more that you weren't showing, but one of the issues I've seen is if you, if you name specific headers to inspect and then you use like the headers to append, which it looks like you were, uh, did you do anything to make sure there were not impersonation headers in the incoming request before? Yes. Because uh, I think the filter you showed would not have uh, actually captured them. And, so, they, and it gets merged is the problem. So the incoming request. Yeah, gets... yeah, that's where the authorization server, we basically look at, validate, hey, nobody is actually including their own you know, impersonation headers. So if there is anything, we nullify everything as part of the authorization server itself before we add the actual valid. So even if someone adds it, we overwrite it with the than a system but impersonating. Where was that uh, implemented? Because unless it was more of the policy than you showed, is that before the XLSE? Uh, or it's, is it it's a more as part of the authorization server. It's well, after HTTP filter configuration where it basically makes a call to authorization I server. I think the configuration you showed wouldn't capture those headers. I wouldn't. Maybe it does. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's very simplified version. <laughs> yes, it's a simplified version. But yes, you can configure that in Envoy itself. Like, hey, do not, you know, accept any of the other headers. Uh, you can, you know, we have the other headers where, of course, we specifically have to whitelist the headers before it even goes to the HTTP yes. filter. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, cool. And I'll mention for one of the previous people who asked a question, I've used Istio. Uh, off service a bit more than in a slightly different situation, but it's a another choice with like a OAuth two proxy. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Got it. Thank you, guys. All right.